Welcome to our first Fall Women's Leadership Forum, titled A Conversation on the Impact of COVID-19 on Utah Women and Work. I'm Dr. Susan Madsen, founding director of the Utah Women and Leadership Project, and also the Karen Haight Huntsman Endowed Professor of Leadership in the John M. Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University. And I'm the host and will be the panel moderator today. This event furthers the mission of the Utah Women and Leadership Project, which is to strengthen the impact of Utah girls and women. We serve Utah and its residents by first, producing relevant, trustworthy, and applicable research, second, creating and gathering value, valuable resources, and third, convening trainings and events that inform, inspire, and ignite growth and change for all Utahns. And this is one of those events. I'd like to thank our sponsors, the Utah Education Network, UEN, the John M. Huntsman School of Business, and USU Extension for making this event possible. So today I have three panelists joining me today, and I'd like to eat, uh, introduce each of them, and then we'll just dive in. I'll, I'll give a little bit of an introduction to the study that we're talking about, a large study. Um, and the three that are joining me today were really the leads for, for the qual quantitative and qualitative pieces of this research that we'll talk about today. So really welcome, uh, glad you're interested in this. And uh, we are recording it. If you wanna watch it again or share it with other people, it'll be available soon. So first I'll introduce Dr. Jared M. Hansen. He's an associate professor of marketing in the John M. Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University. And he was previously an associate professor of marketing at the University of North Carolina at Charlotte. He received his PhD at the Rawls College of Business at Texas Tech University, an MBA from the Marriott School of Management at Brigham Young University, and a BS degree from the Fulton College of Engineering at uh, Brigham Young University as well. So he is passionate about engaging in research that advances knowledge related to psychological empowerment, meaningfulness, decision-making, and the performance of leaders, employees, and consumers. Second, Maren Christensen is the Associate Director for the Utah Women in Leadership Project, where she focuses on research strategy and events that empower and make an impact on women. So Maren, Maren came to the UWLP recently from the Ken C. Gardner Policy Institute at the University of Utah, where she conducted survey and qualitative research for various community partners, including women's focused projects. So she's also the co-founder of the Utah Child Care Cooperative, which helps increase, assess, um, increase uh, access to quality, affordable child care so women have the choice to stay and thrive in their careers. And Marin is pursuing a PhD in human development and social policy at the University of Utah, where she is studying the barriers that women face, particularly working women. And then finally, and just as important is Dr. Christopher J. Uh, Hartwell. Um, he is an associate professor of management in the John M. Huntsman School of Business at Utah State University. His research focuses on employee selection, uh, talent management, and the use of technology in organizations. He has published in high quality academic journals such as the Journal of Applied Psychology, the Journal of World Business, uh, Personnel Psychology, and the Journal of Vocational Behavior. Chris has held a variety of professional positions in the field of human resources, and he is a senior certified professional with the Society for Human Resource Management. And he received his PhD in organizational behavior and human resource management from the Cranert School of Management at Purdue University. So to all of you listening, you're, you're welcome to put questions throughout in the Q&A. We'll really be watching that in Zoom. So throughout the presentation today, and we'll feed those, I'll, I'll be watching, some of the other panelists will watch as well, and we'll kind of address those here and there throughout the presentation. So if you want to do that anytime, please do. So good to uh, have all three of you with me today. We thought we'd do this as the first uh, presentation or the first event form that we have because we have been in the mix, right? All of us of uh, data that we collected in January on this study. 
So I'm going to, for, for those of you watching, I'm just going to share a couple of slides that set the stage, and then I'll just dive into questions. And um, just so you know, the four of us were really the, the primary lead researchers on all of the research that have come out um, of the study. So let me um, just briefly share my slides so you can see a little bit of the background here. There we go. So first, what we did is we actually connect, conducted research. We got it together in the fall and uh, we ended up having 3,542 Utah women complete the survey, which is a large study. We worked really hard to get a lot of people to participate. The data was collected, so think about it. As we talk about COVID-19, think about kind of where you were at or where people around you or your companies, where they were at in January of 2021, because that's the month we collected data really from Utah women age 20 or older who were either currently employed part-time, full-time, or who were unemployed specifically due to the pandemic. And so we collected data on a wide variety of topic areas and that included quantitative, so our numbers or the, on a scale of one through seven uh, agreement scale or some open-ended questions to really capture the participants' uh, perceptions and experiences. And we do want to note when you see on the next slide, there was a question, we added the question more than halfway through specifically about the number of children living at home. So Jared, thank you for, for pushing on that because he thought that would be so interesting and it has. So, so just know when you see some of those percentages, especially in the next slide or two, that, um, that we had more participants that did have children. We just started really asking that question later. And then let me just spend a minute to give you some of the demographics. I'm gonna go fairly quickly on this. I'm gonna start with age. So you can just glance at this and see the various ages and the percentages. As you can see, almost 30% in the 30 to 39 area, but a good solid percent of, of, from, from most of the areas. So we, we did get a good, uh, good kind of look, general look at various age groups. If you look at uh, race and ethnicity, um, we worked, I just have to say, Marin helped me with this one. We worked really hard with lots of groups that were that to try and up our numbers in terms of, of women of color, of Hispanics and Asians and Pacific Islander working with chambers and churches and different groups. So we did get some participation there, some good numbers within the Hispanic Latina, but I think all of us would have loved to see a lot more um, uh, perceptions from, from women of color. Just so we're, when you're listening to our conversation today, just kind of keep that in mind. And then what was super interesting, I think, was how many really educated people, look at those numbers of bachelor's degrees and graduate degrees. Since we had such a good showing in terms of numbers, we were still able to, to find some statistics and some significance because we did have representation at different levels. And then in terms of marital status, you can just glance and, and see what we have there. Of course, most, mostly married, but, but a mix of, of singles and other folks as well. In terms of the household income, so if there were a couple of partners in the home, this was combined income. So you can see that we do have a mix. I would have liked, I, I think uh, Marin and Chris and Jared, you probably agree, it would have been nice to have a bit more in that low income. I was really trying to partner with the, the folks that, that even work with homeless people, but we knew that would be tricky because they probably don't have access to computers and so forth. And, and you can take a glance here at the the line, we, we had 30% of frontline employees and then it goes up to executive there. So we really did have quite a mix there of different job types in turn or, and levels. And then uh, number of kids at home, this is the one I wanted to, to, you know, even though it says these numbers, remember we started collecting it really more than halfway through. Um, and then uh, one more slide here. Um, the industries, I think you would find that interesting, and, and you, some of you may have questions there. 
um, but a lot from the education, more education folks are understand, especially higher ed, feel, feel sorry for you when you're trying to collect data sometimes, so they'll participate in that. But you can see the mix. In terms of business, we really split those off into things like financial services and sales and food services, hospitality, and so forth. But we did get representation, even though some, some of them you know, were smaller. And then finally, we really felt strongly that we did want representation from around the state. And as you can see, some of these are individual counties like Utah County, Salt Lake, and so forth. And some are, are groupings of counties in different areas of the state. So we worked, um, worked to get more numbers in certain areas, but the good thing is that, that we did get some participation from, from every county or region within the um, state of Utah. So in terms of now, my last slide before we take it to the panelists, um, we ended up with six briefs and one of them actually is not going, it's done but it's not going to be released until September 1st, which is just next week. So here we go. The, the whole study was called The Impact of COVID-19 on Utah Women and Work. And here we go. These are, these are the specific areas. So those of you listening in, you know, think of that's what we'd be talking about mainly is uh, the first one. That, that one was uh, Chris and Jared took the lead on that and ran the statistics on changes, burnout, and hope. Second one is qualitative. Marin took the lead for that one on career advancement challenges. Third one, back to quantitative, uh, child care and homeschooling. Fourth one, back to qualitative, uh, child or caregiving experiences. And then we just released a week or two ago, one on resilient mindset and well-being. Uh, and, and Jared took the lead on that one with help from Chris and I. Um, and then uh, the one next week, it, that will be released a really in-depth qualitative. And by the way, we got, uh, um, Marin, you can, you can, I think it was at least 2,700 of the women. Yeah, you're nodding. Um, who answered our survey actually gave us qualitative and some of them, some pretty significant stories. Um, I don't know, Marin, if you did, but uh, for me, um, some of that resulted in, in reading some of those stories with a few tears uh, because people are in a lot different situation than, than me. Um, my kids are older and out of the house and we sure found an impact on mothers there. All right, so that's the background and I would love to pose the first question now. And really it's gonna be broad. So I would love to maybe let's start with Jared in response to this first one and then Chris and then then I'll pose a little bit of a different question for Marin, but I'm going to start generally. What effect is co? You know, what what effect is COVID having on Utah working women that is specifically related to the workplace? We'll talk in a minute about, you know, home and work crossover, especially for women. But let's focus really on the workplace. So, so Jared. Um, I'm going with first names on this. Hopefully that's okay. I would love to, to have some of your insights. You get us started and then we'll shift over to Chris. Sure. Um, it's nice to go first because I'm going to share everything probably that Chris was going to say on this, right? Uh, <laughs> uh, as we were digging into the numbers, we discovered it was about 16% um, who, you know, left, uh, you know, those who were in there and uh, roughly close to half, it was about 4.4 out of 10 people who were somehow impacted, furloughed, um, or lost their, their, their job because of the impact, the, the economic impact of restrictions, right, on businesses uh, to try and help health. Um, and so about nearly half, 4.4 out of 10, uh, had some sort of, you know, either reduced hours, reduced pay, uh, lost their job, about 1.4 out of 10, uh, left the workplace of those who did leave, uh, according to our survey, to help take care of someone. Uh, either they had COVID and had to leave, or they're taking care of a, a child, uh, an aged parent, someone. Um, and a little under one, uh, per one out of 10, uh, you know, it was because of just concerns of catching it. Uh, so so a, a different thing, you know, 
What was interesting is you had about 12% who actually ended up with more work. Uh, they, they, they reported they had to take on additional responsibilities, uh, moving from part-time to full-time to cover for those who left, uh, taking on additional jobs. To me, the most interesting thing was looking at um, the income decrease and the hours increase, right? So uh, a lot of people, it's not just that they had an income decrease, but they also, they were getting less money perhaps, but they were working more hours, right? I mean, that's not the combination we wanna see. Um, that we'd expect, and we did see that the industries with the largest income decrease were manufacturing, food services, and hospitality and tourism. And we'd expect that, that those industries would be heavily hit uh, you know, with, with what was happening there. And at the same time, we, we'd also expect the industries like construction and trade, utilities, nonprofits, those were hit the least when it comes to an income decrease because those services were vital, right? And in fact, everyone is staying home and there's a lot of construction business going on and various things. What to me was most interesting is sort of in the middle that the sales, those employed in sales and those employed in healthcare and medical had income decreases. Um, and yet had our increases, some significant ones. And talking with individuals in those industries, uh, you think of all of the medical professionals who, uh, I was just talking with a few physicians the other day, and it was like, you know, everyone wore masks. And so no one came into our office because they didn't get sick with anything, right? I mean, kids aren't licking doorknobs and eating food off the ground because they're all masked up. And so they, they saw a dramatic decrease in regular illnesses that would commonly happen and then they said, but you know what? And this is after our data, which was in January. This was this summer. They're like, hey, the mask mandate just went away. Kids come out of school. They're now coming back, right? We're, we're seeing an increase in business again. Uh, and so employment is now going up. And they're like, but we'll see what happens in the fall, right? I mean, it's very variable there. Um, and Chris, or not Chris, Jared, real, really quick, I just wanted to mention that teachers were some of the ones that said, you know, their pay often stayed the same, but their hours went way up because all of a sudden they were trying to do all this more and they didn't get compensation. So I'm sure that was part of the mix as well. Yeah. I mean, on education, it was about 13% of them that said their hours increased uh, going across there, supporting them uh, sort of behind the scenes that a lot of people don't think about those working women working in information technology and in finance, their hours increased as well. In fact, about 18, 17 to 18% in information technology, about 19% in the financial services, their hours increased, right? So behind the scenes, right, we have individuals who, you know, like in education where they're having to convert and do everything online, but no one's really paying attention to those in information technology and finance and others that are really have to ramp up behind the scenes to help support all of that. So it's not just in one area that we have this increase going on. So that, that's what I would uh, chime in. And I wonder Chris. sometimes, uh, like me, you know, some, I, then I didn't have to drive as much, but then sometimes those hours just went right back into work, right? And for some it didn't. And I, I think Marin will talk a little bit when we get to the qualitative data on, on that. Thank you, Jared. Chris, what else did you see? Yeah, I think Jared did a great job of, of summarizing uh, the things that we're seeing, but just a couple of things that I wanted to touch on, you know, that we don't think about that Jared mentioned. You know, we talked about the number of, of women who left the workforce or had reduced hours or moved from full-time to part-time. And that's what we kind of think about, right, with COVID, those that have to kind of leave uh, the workforce in order to, you know, take on other challenges at home or with children that have to stay home from school, those types of things. Um, but as Jared mentioned, there was a significant portion of the sample that increased their hours. You know, when those people leave the workforce um, or cut back hours, um, you know, other women are picking up that slack in terms of what they're doing. Um, and, you know, oftentimes that may not be voluntary. It may be that, you know, you're the one that's left. And if you want to keep your job and if you want to keep working, you have to increase those hours. Um, and like Jared mentioned, uh, industries like healthcare, like education, like IT, you might be in a salaried position where you are working more hours, but you're not making any more money. Yeah, 
There's so many interesting things. All, all of these reports are on our website, except for the one next week that's going to be released, uh, released and lots of other data as well. So Marin, I know Susan, that- Susan, if, if, if I can pop right back in and just piggyback <laughs> off of what Chris just said, because we have a comment uh, in, in the chat box talking about Delta, right? And are we gonna see a surge again this fall in individuals leaving that workforce? And, and yes, uh, th there will be, I, I hope it's not as large as what we had this last year because we have a different approach going on within the K through 12 education system and other things trying to keep those schools open more to support families more. But I think people need to be prepared for the scenario that Chris discussed, that what if in my work environment, part of the workforce is not there and I am asked to do more proactively thinking now you know, trying to create more of a resilient mindset, how am I going to do that? So it's not when it happens, but rather in advance that I have a plan in place so it doesn't take over my entire life. How am I going to do this? I mean, that uh, we call this, you know, when I teach competitive intelligence, we call this gray rhino, right? It's not a black swan event that no one could receive. It's a gray rhino. Everyone sees it coming, but no one thinks about it in advance and coming up with an individual plan what am I gonna do when it happens? And we have that opportunity right now. So I th I'm thankful for that comment in the chat room. We need to individually plan when it does happen, how will we be resilient to it so it doesn't crush us? And, and I was just gonna mention that there are many, many companies um, that have, have still not gone back to work. So they've all of a sudden realized that wait, maybe telecommuting does work. <laughs> maybe people can be productive at home. Um, and, and so it's interesting because I, I see very few workplaces that have actually gone all the way back. So when we see increases, if it continues to increase, and we're not the medical experts here, of course, um, that, that we have some solutions. But, but Jared and Chris, I also wanted to mention that a lot of those folks that just quit from the workforce um, were forced because, you know, hospitality shut down, the hotels shut down, the food establishments for a time shut down and, and others. Um, and Marin, I'm gonna throw it to you because you have some actually some in-depth comments uh, from the story. So Marin was the lead. We had so many researchers working in coding, but Marin, your, the qualitative analysis that, that you specifically uncovered, you uncovered that 61% of respondents mentioned a negative effect to their career advancement specifically. So talk about that. Talk about what are some of those ways that they did see that. So that was our snapshot or the, our brief number two. And this is really important to us at UWLP because we focus on increasing the impact of women. And if this is the way women see that they, you know, want to thrive and pursue their um, dreams, uh, a negative career Im impact just really has, um, sometimes that it was really long-term or short-term, but I really wanted to answer about kind of the future as well, because we'll kind of get into it in a second, but um, as far as like preparing yourself, and I want to throw that out to employers and spouses and just partners in the home, because we'll kind of get into how women felt mostly unsupported. And even if they were working from home and their employers were allowing for that, just the understanding from their employer where they didn't feel like they had to work more hours to prove productivity and just kind of given some grace, um, if at all possible <laughs> to meet the bottom line. But there was just an overwhelming kind of feeling that um, they felt like they had to prove that they could do it. So it really caused a lot of burnout in that regard. But regarding career advancement, um, most crucially, you know, those that lost work, they lost their career momentum. So 11% either saw their businesses suffer, they lost their jobs, they lost pay. And then if they found other work, it was sometimes lower paying or irrelevant to their career goals. So that's a setback. And in those cases, um, they're moving backwards in their career, right? So at minimum, these are short-term setbacks, but a lot of other people um, really felt like there was more long-term impacts. Some also were offered promotions, offered pay raises, offered opportunities for growth. 
but they declined them because they didn't feel like they could absorb any more work or any more responsibility over what they were already like having to handle at home um, on top of their job. So they declined, they declined career advancement so they could have more flexibility and a manageable workload and a better schedule so they could be there for their families. Um, we had a lot of respondents talk about the lack of face-to-face -face time and the impact that had on their career. So, you know, they might've felt safe at home, but um, knew that their career advancement really depended on maybe networking or mentorship or looking available for projects, being able to kind of shine in the workplace. Um, and obviously like due to the economic precariousness, um, raises and opportunities uh, were put on hold like across the board. So if they were planning on a promotion, they were planning on a raise, companies were just kind of like, we don't know what's happening. Um, we're putting a hold to that. Yeah, there were so many, the stories are powerful. And if, if you, uh, those of you listening, um, just go to our briefs. Our briefs are like six pages. Um, I think I let one go to seven, which <laughs> broke the rule a little bit, but six pages, um, but we actually give snapshots of some of the, the actual stories and the statements that are in that. So thank you for that. Uh, if anything else comes up in terms of that throughout uh, for you three, just, just jump in if something kind of connects. Now I would like to shift over, and this is where I think some folks want to go. In fact, one of the the, the conversation or one of the chat comments uh, specifically asked about that. And that is, you know, how has, so we talked about the workplace, but family work, non-work work all goes together in your effectiveness as, as an employee, right? As a leader or whatever role that we have. So let's talk a little bit about family and health and that that supposed non-work kind, kind of area, um, health, you know, those kinds of things. So Chris, let me go ahead and have you start this time. Um, and then, then we'll shift over to Jared. I'm gonna keep you last, Marin, because you've got the qualitative data that can, you can just add some insight there. Yeah, so in terms of kind of the non-work impacts and, and as is mentioned in the chat here, those kind of things go hand in hand, right? If you've got, things happening outside of work that's going to impact what's going on at work as well. Um, but due to COVID, uh, women saw an increased um, stress, burnout, um, particularly um, those uh, of childbearing age, those with children in the home um, that you know maybe have lots to juggle uh, in terms of uh, managing work relationships, managing children, managing school, um, all those roles uh, that are played uh, can be difficult. And it becomes more difficult when you're working from home, right? And there isn't that separation between work and home uh, anymore. Uh, another thing that I, I, I think is interesting is that there's a lot of worry about, you know, having enough money to. Uh, provide for your family. And that was even more pronounced for uh, women, who are entrepreneurs, right? So those that are own their own business, you know, for, for a lot of people, if, if the business decreases, you still have your job, or maybe you get cut back hours. But for entrepreneurs, it's so direct that when business decreases, or if you have to shut down, you know, that's your livelihood. Uh, and so that it was even more pronounced uh, for those women uh, entrepreneurs as well. Um, so, so that just gives some of the some of the outside of work um, feelings, emotions, um, and I'll I'll let Jared carry on because there's more than that. Yeah, and I'll I'll just mention one thing. So you you mentioned you know it was hard for women to work at home, but but and that is so true. I mean, bringing those kids, trying to do homeschooling, trying to do all of those. Marin, I'll talk about that in just a minute. However, some women didn't have a choice. They did, and in fact, you saw some of those women leaving because they couldn't get childcare and they needed to go out. They were in the healthcare profession or people that couldn't. So it's a luxury in some ways, even though it's hard. So, so many, and some just didn't have partners and so forth. So just wanted to mention that, Jared. Yeah, so as Chris just mentioned, I mean, we saw in the data that, uh, you know, everyone, you know, uh, increased burnout. 
you know, decrease when it comes to physical well-being, decrease when it comes to mental well-being. And, and these things aren't really surprising because, you know, we're spending extra hours, you know, we're, we're getting burned out on this. Uh, you know, as we spend extra hours on the job, you know, there's less time for taking care of that physical well-being. Plus, all the facilities are closed down that people would normally attend to. Uh, you, know, uh, you know, on the mental well-being side, people are spending more time with people that they, they don't have to see all day in their households. And now they're having to deal with them all day, right? And, you know, I remember how many times, you know, my spouse said, please go to the office, right? I mean, but that was a common thing, right? I mean, we're, we're in new territory here. The boundaries are becoming blurred. Uh, me time, which is a very important thing, you know, is, is gone. But this also means this is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for everyone who's attending this, watching this as an individual, as a company that has employees, and as a company that has customers. How can you support yourself, others, in regards to physical well-being, mental well-being, and me time, right? Looking at this fall and what's gonna go on rather than just look at the past and, and gripe about it. Um, what products, what services can we offer going forward that apps, other things, I mean, every company out there, how can you connect your product or service to me time? To, to helping your customers? How can you connect it to improve mental well-being without the stigma of that they're having to get, you know, uh, you know, help for anxiety, help for depression, help for other things that everyone is going through because there is stigmas attached to those things, unfortunately. And most people are concerned about getting them. Uh, you know, they don't want to be perceived as that person who's needy. So, but how can you do that effectively, right? What do you need to develop uh, in either in the workplace or for your customers or as far as apps go? to help create these wonderful, important things. So it's a problem, but it's also an opportunity for smart companies to really grow and succeed. That's such an important note. And I think some companies are, many companies have gone there in some ways because they didn't have a, have a, have a choice, at least the basics of it. But now, I mean, in Utah, we've rebounded and we have a great economy in Utah. So now it's more, how do we keep it's some of the same things. It's some of the same uh, things that companies can do during pandemic, but also after to retain employees. And so Marin, so you know, as we know, most of the narrative around COVID-19, especially uh, around women from not just in Utah, but from around the world has focused on being parents of children who live at home. Um, so young children, but teenagers as well, that, have been affected by school closures. So what specific challenges did caregiver respondents bring up in their com comments? And, and before, before you dive in, just when we say the word caregiver, we're talking about a few different things, aren't we? We are, I mean, caregivers are obviously parents, but they're caregivers of your own parents. Um, we also cover child care providers and those in the child care industry. So I would definitely uh, recommend checking out the report. But as far as like working mothers goes, um, what we heard was just how impossible it felt to manage it all. They didn't feel like they were giving either their job or their family adequate attention. And with that came immense feeling of guilt and burnout. And that's kind of what we cover as a teaser in the next brief as well, because, um, you know, a mental health decline was the most often mentioned kind of effect and sentiment from these open-ended comments. Um, so women just felt, we, we heard over and over, uh, they're barely hanging on, they're barely sleeping, and they're putting their own needs last. Um, one of the comments said, either the relationship with my children suffers or my productivity at work. Another one said, I feel like a slacker when I attend to my family's needs. Um, how awful a feeling. Um, and you could obviously especially feel the desperation from the comments from single mothers who couldn't afford to leave their employment and they had to find a way through. One of them said they sympathize with the woman that, would, that left the workforce because they would if they could as well. Um, we heard from people that uh, depended on their parents for, you know, caregiving of their kids, but couldn't anymore due to COVID risks. Same about an ex-husband that works in the medical field and they didn't want to put their kids at risk. Um, and in this, and when we talk about, you know, the effects on caregivers, uh, they really talk about the support they felt 
from their employer or their spouse at home and more like more importantly the support they didn't feel um <laughs> so Marin, Marin, if, if my memory serves right when we just for those listening i mean the 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 effort that it takes to code 2,700 comments is huge. You code all of those comments. It's 2,700 respondents at about 16,000. Oh, that's true. Comments. That's yeah. so true. But what we found in terms of their perceptions of people that, that had partners, that 24, if this what's in my mind, 24% said they had a supportive partner and 76% said they did not have a supportive partner. Um, so, uh, so when we're talking about like <laughs> employers, please be a little bit more graceful and supportive of your employees, um, and your working moms and your working parents, we really need to be talking about spouses at home too. It didn't even, you know, in these comments, it didn't seem like there was a reason given. It was just like, for some reason, it feels like all of the caregiving responsibility falls on me, you know? So it's just being mindful and how impossible and, um, I just feel, especially now, if this happens all over again, uh, it's just not going to be good. And we really need to be supporting these working moms. Um, and I do want to really point out that those that talked about a supportive employer, their, their loyalty increased for sure. They talked about just how grateful they were. And for those that didn't have a supportive employer, Oftentimes, if they weren't already looking and found um, a, an employer that was more understanding, um, they have a plan too. So, we did see that in lot, so many comments that, in in fact, uh, in terms of industries, just the way that companies shop, but also the treatment, healthcare, and education. Sometimes, that they said, you know, I'm not leaving now, but I, I, I think I'm going to leave this industry. It's been my whole career, and I'm not sure I want to do this again. Um, or I may, might not leave my employer right this second, like you said, but yeah, I'm seeing the true colors and don't want you. Those that, there were some that were so loyal to their employee, uh, their supervisors or managers, they, they just loved them. And they're like, I'm here, I am here. So, you, um, so let's- Susan, you know, if I could jump. Oh, sure. I just I just want to kind of piggyback on what Marin said and answer um, a question that that's up here in the Q and A um, that talks about you know um, this our discussion um, while they 100% agree with what we're talking about they wonder if COVID had any impact on men because we're from focusing on women here um, and to what extent did women have it harder than men um, and from our data that's a little bit hard to parse out um, because the data was focused and collected um, just with women respondents. Uh, and so we can't make a comparison between men and women. And a lot of things that we're talking about, particularly the effects of leaving the workforce and different things like that, um, obviously are going to apply to men as well. Um, but as Marin mentioned, you know, historically, traditionally, uh, women have taken the major role uh, in dealing with the household and with children and educational responsibilities and those types of things. Um, and so a lot of the respondents, there was a question that asked, you know, whether the effects of COVID, um, particularly those outside of work effects, were harder on women than men. And most of the, the respondents uh, agreed that that was true. Now, there's some self-serving bias, right? Because we're surveying and they see what happens to them and they may not see what happens to their spouse or to, you know, the other professional men or, or things like that as much as they do to themselves. But I think that it's clear that, you know, women have been strongly impacted um, by COVID and probably more so than men, particularly when uh, it comes to balancing uh, life at work and life outside of work. And I so, wanted to mention too, oh, sorry, go ahead. I, I was just going to comment on, on what both of you are saying there, because Chris mentioned we didn't have data from men in this particular survey, you know, uh, on the side, uh, I went out there and, and surveyed a couple hundred people. You know, uh, I spent several years on the East Coast before I came to Utah State, but using some of my connections I had out there on the East Coast and um, through former students, just surveyed people in business out there because I had a, a large network out there, men and women. And it, to me, I don't find it surprising that everyone felt that they were doing more uh, than an equitable amount 
of chores and childcare and help with the homeschooling, everyone felt that. Uh, and so what it really indicated was a need for better communication, right? Uh, for better communication within relationships, not just at work, but within households uh, and a division of responsibility where they understand what the other person is actually doing. Uh, because there's, it really became clear through that survey that there's just a lack of understanding of everything that one's partner is taking on. Uh, everyone uh, was expressing that. So now who's actually doing more? I would say everyone is, right? I, I do yeah, think yeah, that's right? true. So it is universal, but is it equitable? Uh, and that's important because everyone is doing more. That's something that communication, and that's, it's not easy because those defenses go up, but hard conversations need to happen. And we did, we did find, I mean, we had a lot of good qualitative responses from women who did, were smaller in the percentage to that, that did say, yeah, there's more equity in my home now, and did talk about wonderful things their spouses did. We just saw many, many less of those comments than, than the other. Maren, I know you wanted to jump back in. I just was going to say how we heard from women when like describing uh, the increased work and the effect on their career that they noticed maybe their male colleagues um, or their colleagues without kids, their male colleagues with spouses at home or their colleagues without kids getting more opportunities because it's viewed as though they have the time. Um, and they also talked about having feeling kind of resentment from work for having young children. Um, so all of these kind of things just piling on top of each other. And it's just not a surprise that women had felt a, a mental health decline during this. Great. I said great, and I didn't mean great that they felt it. I just meant great comment. Thank you. Um, before we shift to the, the next question I had, I, I do want to, since we're on this topic already, and we've talked a little bit about, we've just touched on a few of the findings really from workplace and some at home, and of course, they all impact each other. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the quantitative and qualitative um, statistics or findings that came out in terms of special groups. So women of color, um, you know, we talked a little bit about women at home, you know, maybe lower income, you know, education, any of those demographics, Chris and Jared ran, ran some of those, but Maren, maybe I'll have you start because uh, there were some very profound comments from women of color on maybe the, the effect that they felt. Um, as, and we had some that really had different intersectionalities, right? They were women, they were women of color. And a few, I remember reading comments that, that were women of color and in low income, not, you know, there's women of color in all incomes, but just give us a few. Yeah, and single mothers too. We had a whole section in one of our briefs about that, so. Yeah, actually one of the, one of the things I pulled out was because we heard from so many teachers and I wanted to talk about them because if you're a woman of color, if you're working essential jobs, you're kind of facing, you know, these multiple barriers um, to your life and just and navigating this. Um, so many teachers mentioned feeling and some didn't, some thought like some of these restrictions were too much, right? But Mostly they mentioned feeling really unsupported um, by the community and district leadership. And we heard a lot of kind of sacrificial lamb type, type language, um, how overworked they felt because they all of a sudden need, needed to come up with like three separate lesson plans. You know, they had to do one for in-person, remote and a hybrid option. Um, they talked about how unsafe and fearful they felt having to navigate angry and stressed and scared parents how much more work it was to check in on students who were also struggling and how heartbroken they were to see their students struggling in some cases just kind of dropping out and the powerlessness um, they feel and they also feel so much responsibility and one one said i feel totally invalidated and undervalued another said i have never felt more expendable disrespected and have never considered leaving my job until now and so I now want you to imagine teachers that also had young children of their own and think of teachers that were also single parents. Um, and we would just hear that 
they were getting two hours of sleep a night in order to fit it all in. Um, but I just, I kind of wanted to point that out because as you, as you listen to what teachers in general went through, and then you think about all of the different ways the pandemic was affecting people um, who didn't have the support really due to like risk uh, is just really heartbreaking. Yeah, that's that's an important thing to to pull out. Marin, I'm gonna keep keep and ask you one more quick question and we'll get back to some other things. But oh my gosh, I was heartbreak broken by some of the comments I have to say about from child care providers. Um, and they felt very much, I, I just remember reading some of the comments on why weren't we on the top of the list for vac for vaccines? because we're the ones taking care of the healthcare, you know, um, and how scared they were for their own health, but, but they just went through a lot, I, I know. Any quick comments about that? Yeah, just really disappointed they weren't viewed as essential as well. And I think I just saw a comment asking about um, if sentiments were so similar for frontline workers and essential workers. And I think this is a perfect example because they're not paid very well. Um, they're not given this, this status, they're not given the vaccination yet, they're expected to care for those that are on the front line. So they're just at risk. Um, we were lucky, at least in Utah, um, that, that the, the federal funding helped keep providers open, but providers also had to implement safety protocols, decrease their slots. So like, that was it rough. still wasn't easy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was just, um, and, and the whole thing, you know, you and I, Marin, are doing so much on in the childcare conversations, but the whole thing, and I think when you're emotionally stressed, it, it comes out, some of those things come out, and many of them said, we're, st we're not valued, when they do such, I mean, many of them have, not maybe not many of them, but some of them have advanced degrees, bachelor's degrees in childcare development, or early education, or, or other child development, yet they're still viewed as babysitters when there's really a difference, right? Between babysitting and real good quality um, care for their children, which is learning. It's not just watching them. Right, shaping those early brains is a science for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, Jared and Chris, I haven't forgotten about you. <laughs> I would love so, any, so, any comments about any of that. Yeah, back, back to this question of are there certain groups that have experienced negative impacts more strongly than others? One of the things I've been seeing in the data as I continue to look at it is just the importance of internet access. Mm. Uh, groups of individuals, uh, oftentimes um, that income, uh, certain geographies, you know, other factors too, but groups of individuals who have less reliable or less fast internet access had a much harder time with this. And that makes sense because they're having to do their work, you know, online, their children are having to do their work online, right? And so it's one thing if one person is on the computer, it's another thing if you have five or six devices trying to connect and it keeps dropping connections uh, within a home um, and not just during that time period of work, but even more recently, even with the vaccines, uh, the groups of individuals and especially the inner city area where they're like, hey, you know, I have to sign up online, but I can't sign up online. And so there is a feeling that they're not receiving, you know, equitable access to the vaccine as well as to other things at work for their children because of that requirement for fast, reliable internet access, uh, as well as as compounded when they don't have access to transportation, when it's harder to get rides, when the buses have reduced schedules, when there's decreased mobility. And so those factors um, tend to, the groups of individuals that face those factors, they, they are having a much harder time with this. Um, so that's one thing uh, that we have seen in there. Yeah, and Jared, I can't and, remember. And just to go. I was just gonna follow up really quick with, with one thing. For Jared or Chris, I don't know which one of you took the lead on that, that one study. I think it was Jared maybe. That we I picture the 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 figures in the article that had internet connections and or internet, but it also had um, something about how many children are. Is this coming back? And so, if you had teenagers in the home, Chris, you're nodding. Do you remember that? 
if you had teenagers do. Yeah. home, then then some of the stress went down a little bit. I, I, I shouldn't have brought it up because I can't remember all the details, but one of you could look that up. Yeah, no problem. So so what that what our data showed is that, you know, those that had kids in the home, you know, had additional stress related to, um, you know, working from home related to, you know, internet access and kids being able to do the things that they need to do for schooling, all of those different things. But what we found out was that for those who had young children at home, you know, the zero to three range, there was a lot more stress and burnout related to um, balancing work and home because you, it's, it's, you're on call all the time when you have young children that age. But as their age increased, those that had uh, children that, you know, were school age children, there was less, there was still, you know, some stress in terms of work and, and home balance, but less of that, but more concern about having adequate internet and adequate access for the children to be able to do the things they need for you to be able to do the things that you need at home. And so, you know, those, those concerns shifted from taking care of the children to, you know, having the resources necessary for the kids to do what they had. And another interesting thing was the more children uh, people had, um, it tended to go down their stress for balancing uh, work and life. And that's probably because as you have more children, obviously you have older children too, uh, that you can, you know, give responsibilities to and that can help with younger children as well. And so that, that was interesting. The other thing that I'll mention, just kind of going off what Jared said, um, when we're looking at specific groups that, you know, may have had a harder impact because of COVID, we are looking at those that don't have access to those resources like internet and like transportation. And what we found is that, you know, four categories tended to, you know, be more impacted. So those with less education, those with um, lower income, um, those in racial minorities, uh, and those single mothers. And all four of those things, the thing that they have in common is the availability to resources, right? And that's what it all comes down to, is not feeling that there are resources or not having those resources um, available uh, to you as much. Yeah, thank you. We did run, uh, it seemed like in, in uh, the briefs, we ran a little bit and a couple of times on our samples of women of color. Does anything else pop up in terms of, of what, and Marin, you too, any of you, specifically focused on women of color and some of their experiences and struggles or, or what they said? Seem, it seems like women of color as a whole had, had more uh, worry about certain things. It seems like finances and some other things when we compared that data. Any comments on that? And Marin, I know you had a whole section uh, in one of our briefs on that. Yeah, so quantitatively, I'll just, I'll just say real quick and then Marin can jump in with, with the qualitative, which I think there's some really good deep data in the qualitative. Quantitative, like you mentioned, uh, women of color tended to you know, have more financial concerns, more concerns about you know, having adequate food, those types of things. The other thing that I think um, is of note um, is that, you know, compared to white women, um, Hispanic Latina women were also more concerned with domestic violence um, and domestic violence um, because of, of COVID uh, and, and those types of things. So there are definitely some, some things to be concerned about um, with our minority groups. And you brought up domestic violence, which I'm so glad you brought that up, Chris, because we found, and I'm not remembering the statistics, but wasn't it around 10% of the people in our study specifically? So these are just people in our study. I mean, back to the percentage at the first that Jared shared, 16% of women in our study. But remember that a lot of people didn't even have time to take our survey, right? Um, so it could be definitely higher. But is, are you remembering that correctly? Was it about 10, 11% of women said, uh, Jared, you're nodding, said that they were concerned about uh, violence, increased violence in the home? Just under that number, yes. Yeah. Okay. And, Mary and also, I would probably say that if, if that's the case, um, they might be less likely to disclose on a survey where 
they may worry like their answers could be accessed later, you know, um, if that I mean, type of violence is going Yeah, on. before you jump into your last comment, let's just, let me just tell folks, you know, we have planned to go for another 15 minutes. So um, after Marin responds to this, we're gonna pause for just a second and have all the panelists look again in the chat. And so if you have questions coming up, just put them in the chat right now, because uh, we're gonna pause and take some questions in just a second. So Marin, back to you. Oh yeah, I was just looking through my um, section where we discussed the experiences of women of color. And, um, you know, on top of feeling the microaggressions and racism, already it was kind of exacerbated for some of these uh, women of color that responded to our survey. Um, in one case, um, they had undocumented family members that lost their jobs. So they had to, they found themselves having to support their entire family during this. Uh, we had one participant talk about just wanting to leave Utah because um, kind of with, with the racism they're feeling already on top of the pandemic and seeing other people um, get recognized for things while they're doing the same amount of work. It just has gotten to be, be too much. So, you know, how we can kind of look internally at ourselves and, and be sure we're not, um, we're not, we're kind of addressing any implicit biases we may have. So we can just ensure that you know, our women of color are feeling more supportive and valued here. Thank you. Appreciate that. All right. I am really um, expecting you three panelists to be looking in the chat. Uh, so let's uh, let just let's pop in any of you in terms of seeing a question that that we can talk about here. Uh, appreciate the, the comments and questions that we can address here. Jared? You know, I'm sure somewhere uh, within all the comments that are coming in, uh, there, there's a question about what can we do to lessen all these negative impacts, right? Yeah. Speaking more to the positive side of this. And there is some great stuff that we did find in there. Just, you know, what are some things organizations have been doing or could be doing to lessen the negative impact? Um, so to, to me, I mean, I see some of that in there, but I think it's important that we see that there is sort of a, a, a silver lining to all of this, uh, you know, we, we are seeing in the data that about half of them are giving flexibility in work location. That, that means there's half that could be, right? Uh, others are giving flexibility in working hours. Uh, many of them, about a third, are giving mental health counseling, right? Um, you know, what I think they should be doing, you know, uh, in addition to that, is helping people. And this is one theme I've seen through the qualitative, as I've been looking at that, as well as the quantitative is allowing women at work to have a sense of connection and the ability to talk, right? Um, whether that's luncheons or dinners or events that all follow common sense health guidelines, right? But to be able to connect, it could, some could be virtual, but there needs to be in person. And it doesn't have to be at work, whether it's bowling night or card games or almost anything, right? But employees are desperate for a chance to connect. Right, uh, that's something I've, I just keep reading through as I look through the study results. They're just desperate for a chance to connect with other adults, yeah. okay, with other adults in person, okay? Uh, and so anything, you know, as organizations, uh, as people in organizations that we can do to facilitate others being able to connect in person, even small instances, is just gonna have tremendous positive benefits. Um, and as we're those who are leaders in organizations who are joining with us, I would say a couple other things that you could be doing is think about the way that you praise uh, within the organization and, and conveying processes that lead to learning, right? The way that you treat setbacks as opportunities for learning, right? Um, the way that you focus on presenting skills as learnable and conveying what the organization values, the way you give feedback, um, you know, all these, you know, sort of, you know, uh, Chris could speak to these things, you know, within human resources, they're just important leadership traits uh, that, that we talk about in normal times, but critically important in helping people to connect uh, with leaders, to connect with other employees, just to connect with adults uh, in general, so. Yeah. I also see a question on, oh, sorry, Susan, did you want to follow up on good. that? Okay. 
I see a question on any insights on women seeking education. And as far as qualitatively, yes. Um, we covered that women have put off education either do, you know, like you said, to burnout uh, time, you know, they are more financially unstable right now. So cost, um, and that's kind of in our career advancement. It's covered in our career advancement brief because women have decided to not pursue that education that they wanted to get ahead with. So yes, as far as like the comments go, we definitely heard that brought up. But there was also the other side that really came out more in the quantitative data that really did say, especially if I'm remembering this what right, Chris and, and Jared, especially among the, the frontline employees or those employees that didn't have the, the bachelors and higher, that they said, you know, I'm rethinking this. I think I might want to jump in, go back and get a certification or get back into school so I have more options. So there was some recognition of that. Um, and it seems like we covered that in one of the briefs as well. So I think probably both ends, you know, of wait, I need to be prepared. I need to have more choices. I want to get back into school and too much yeah. going on now. Maybe I need to drop out of school. Probably different situations. We, we saw that also back in 2008, uh, you know, with the recession. Anytime there are periods, you know, when the economy sort of slumps, we'll, we'll see, uh, you know, individuals saying, hey, I am getting laid off or I need to leave. This is a good chance to change the direction of my career, to, to find whether it's certifications or, you know, through institutions of higher learning, but to reorient what I'm going to do. And so, um, we have seen some increases in enrollment. Uh, you know, it's it's different looking at like freshmen at a university versus those coming in who have been out several years and they're looking to just get the upper division classes and, and real hard skills, right? Um, those are two very unique, different circumstances during the COVID. Uh, and, and Chris, before I see if you have comments, I just wanna make sure because everybody's not seeing the comments, we just have them come in to us. Um, Someone, someone said, I think some parents feel the stress of kids falling behind on academics that, and that, that worry, you know, could be a, a you know, I wouldn't be surprised if, ki if, if most kiddos are performing below grade level. And it seems like I've seen some media on that. Um, also, someone asked about single parents. We've talked a little bit about that. Of course, the single mothers, we have, we have data on there, some, some impossible situations. Um, someone said, I wonder if comments uh, were from the frontline workers were similar. We did some statistic on them. Some, some of the examples that we've used are actually um, not as much in the career advancement, although some, but in other areas, we definitely used a lot of their comments. Um, another person said some schools set up hotspots. That was back to the internet conversation. Um, for internet access, who, who, uh, but then she said, uh, who wants to sit in a hot parking lot to join a class on Zoom? <laughs> Very interesting. But uh, someone else said hot spots at playgrounds and parks and other things might, might be smarter to do. Um, and then I think we've addressed some of the other ones as well. Uh, Chris, did you have something you wanted to um, pop, pop in? Or are you good going back? For you? Yeah, I'll, just from the Q&A side, so we were looking at the chats, but also on the Q&A side, and that's what Marin was getting at with, um, you know, seeking education. I'm the person who, who mentioned that, mentioned that their organization provides scholarships for single mothers and seem to have fewer applicants. So that's an interesting thing about this pandemic that's different than, you know, maybe 2008 with that recession. 2008, you lose your job, you can go to school. Um, and that's still the case here, but the pandemic is also affecting how schools operate. And schools were online for a while, you know, getting a college degree um, and not being able to go onto campus or things like that. So it's impacted education in a way that maybe, you know, women or other workers who want to go back to school, maybe they're thinking now's not the right time um, because of all of these things that have uh, upset the way that universities are operating as well. I like that. Thank you. I want to go back now to Jared's earlier. He, he had brought up, you know, what can organizations do? So he had brought up some ideas, but Chris and Marin, I'd love to have you 
go and, and give us your insights specifically on, you know, um, some of the, the things that organizations can do, some of the things maybe women said that organizations can do. We've talked a little bit about that, but let's have your, Chris, why don't you jump back in and, and do that and then Maren. Uh, sure. One of, one of the interesting things I think uh, it's mentioned one of the first briefs and also one of the most recent briefs is talking about flexible work arrangements, whether it's flexible hours, um, flexible in terms of where you do that work. Um, you know, outside of our research, uh, there's research that asks, you know, executives or high level um, managers in companies whether or not they provide these types of things. And 80, 90 percent will say, yeah, we're providing those types of things to our employees because of this. Well, in our research, we saw that only like 40, 50% of respondents said that they have that option. And so that gives us, you know, there's some uh, differing opinions there. And either number one, um, organizations think they're doing a lot better job than they are, or number two, they're able to offer those things, but they don't offer them to everybody. There are certain situations, certain jobs, you can't work from home or where your hours have to be, you know, eight to five or whatever it is. Uh, and so, you know, you have to think about what you can offer and, that, you know, give that grace and offer what you can. But the other thing that goes along with that, and that's where we get into this resilient mindset, is that with, if you're offering your employees the opportunity to work from home, that, you know, flexibility, but it also increases uh, the stress from combining their work and their life and not having that separation. And so you have to prepare them for that, help them through that transition, um, because there's a lot more ambiguity, there's a lot less structure, um, and so it can backfire um, if they're not prepared properly and, you know, have that communication uh, throughout when they work from home. And just so you know, Utah is kind of late to the remote work conversation. 20 years ago, plus I did a dissertation on telecommuting and work and family um, and published that many, many years ago. And there are really good recommendations on how to put the, these types of, of, um, of uh, programs forward. And by the way, just uh, the research continues to say that a person's relationship and support with their direct supervisor, manager, is one of the most important things for retention of people, you know, and, and sometimes, especially in those early days, I don't think managers or supervisors, some of them just had no clue what to do, and others just intuitively knew what to do um, from their experiences. Maren, I want to move you over to where, where we just have a few minutes left. So what strategies specifically, and, and we're talking about working women, but working women uh, five hours a week, 10 hours a week, full-time, we have a lot of full-time in our study. Um, what have working women found to really reduce the impacts or, or even the benefits? You know, I, I mean, we collected that some actually saw some benefits, right? That's what I really wanted to cover with this question, because if you let me do another qualitative brief, I would focus on the question, what benefits have you seen from the pandemic? Like, obviously, we have covered those that felt the increased responsibility of care work as impossible, but um, by far and away, flexibility and remote work options were so beneficial to these respondents where they had you know, the, the decreased commute time meant more time for hobbies, for their family, for exercise. It just felt like a weight lifted. Those were really great comments to read. Some felt like they were able to increase their skills. Um, some thrived. I had a comment here about um, what did the qualitative say about, you know, negative sentiment towards career advancement. Well, negative was like kind of the majority. Plenty of people said I've actually gotten promotions and more opportunities. And um, that could just be a, a place where, you know, women just had more time to kind of to focus on other things. Obviously, uh, not always the case of women and, and mothers with young kids, but flexibility and remote work can really have many benefits and employ on, on that flip side, sure, offer that they really need it 
employers, but just also the grace that we've been talking about, understanding of how precarious the situation's about to be in the next few months. Um, and I also just want to implore, obviously, like partners and spouses at home. So that's what I know I've just repeated myself that I, I brought up these points in the beginning, but it's true. So it's, It is true. And we just have a, a couple minutes because I want to end on time. But an, I real ask, quick, can I just well, I, add I one thing? I want to ask you a question, though, uh, that might get us off. But, but because we have a whole brief that we just released on uh, resilience. And I would love to have you like in one minute do the charts on resilient mindset or growth mindset and the spousal support and the flexible work. Can you give us a kind of a summary of the, do you know what I'm talking about? Uh, absolutely. And uh, that was going to be my point oh. that I wanted to bring up, you know, in regarding to help reduce the impact, right? We, we looked at anxiety. We looked at physical well-being. We looked at mental well-being. And if you compare working women who said that they had a resilient, positive mindset. They, they, they viewed that there's ways that they could solve their problems. That they could figure out ways to solve the problems that they would face, not the ones they're facing now, but they would face. So they had this resilient mindset. Those who had that and did not have flexible working accommodations had less anxiety, less problems physically, less problems emotionally than women who had the workplace accommodations and did not feel that they could figure out solutions to future problems. So just the, the critical importance of an emotional, resilient mindset, right? Of, of having that mindset. The same thing goes within the family. Individuals who said, I have no spousal support, uh, that things are not equitable in, in, in chores and responsibilities at home, but they had a resilient mindset. They said, I think I can figure out solutions to this. They scored lower on anxiety and lower on physical and mental well-being problems than individuals who said, I have great support at home, but they did not have a resilient mindset. Uh, and so just that the huge importance as individuals and as organizations in helping people develop an attitude of a resilient mindset towards the problems that we're going to face. So I do want to make a comment on that, though, but the best. The what? best was when you have the support and you have the mindset, of course. <laughs> and the worst was when you have neither, but the contrast, right? Just emphasizing it's not simply enough to have support. We have to have that right attitude as well. And okay. so how do we go about developing it? Thank you. We were on the same page, Sharon. I, I interrupted you a little bit, but I wanted to make sure you got some of that because it's important. And, and everybody's situation is different. And People struggle in different ways, but working with our kids now and our teenagers and ourselves on having that growth mindset or resilient mindset where you put in the work and you really, that hope is, is, has been shown and not just in our research, but other research as well, to be really, really helpful in helping us get past hard times, um, get past all, you know, all the struggles, including COVID. So, um, Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we want to thank our sponsors one more time, the Utah Education Network, UEN, the John M. Huntsman School of Business, and USU Extension for making this event possible. <music>